Right, let's um let's get started. We'll do a bit of, bit of housekeeping while the last few people um, filter in. Um, thank you to everybody who submitted questions ahead of time. Um, we're going to go through them all today, hopefully. Um, if you didn't have time to pre-submit questions, um, feel free to ask them in the chat um, and we will get to them. We want to make sure everybody's questions are answered. Um, and hopefully some, maybe some of the, the answers we give to other ones can pro provoke some future questions. Future questions. Um, if we can't get everything through everything in our allotted time, um, Alicia and I will find out a way to get you the answer. Um, so don't worry too much about that. Um, and I think that's it. Um, Alicia, should we get st started with um, kind of your story and, and your journey to Airdrie? Yeah, I think, I think that will also be helpful context for the rest of the conversation. And maybe after I do that, Jax can give a bit of background on her. And I think what's really interesting about us is we come from very different backgrounds. We do a very similar role now, um, but hopefully you'll sense from the conversation that we've, we've come from different paths and we, we both love the job for similar reasons, but um, hopefully you can pull different lessons out of both of our journeys. So um, for me, uh, personally, I started by studying commerce law at university, majoring in finance. And if we go back a little bit further to to high school, what I really loved, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do in my career, but what I really loved studying at high school um, was economics and the sciences. So I duxed physics, chemistry and economics. I was I had a very sort of scientific bend, but I really liked using data and analysis to draw meaning from things. So particularly with physics and economics, it has the same sort of um, skill set in that you're explaining a phenomenon that you're seeing either in the economy or in the broader world and using data analysis to, to draw those conclusions. So that was where I, what I enjoyed most. And then when I went to university, um, I was very interested in law, loved studying it, uh, but knew I didn't want to be a lawyer. And then I majored in finance because of my passion in economics and I thought it would be the most employable. Um, and I ended up getting an internship at Credit Suisse um, a couple of years before I finished, when I, before I graduated from university um, in the investment banking team. So um, I was working in M&A. Uh, I thought that that would be where I'd want to build my career for the first, you know, at least the start of my career. And then I would, that would open up a lot of opportunity from, for me from there. And looking back, I think some of the reasons why I chose that career path is it was quite prestigious. It was very hard to get into. It was high paying. All these things that you're looking back is not why you should be making career decisions. But at that stage in my career, that was what was important to me. Um, but when I started my job at CS, I discovered pretty quickly that I wasn't passionate about investment banking. It wasn't the, the life that I wanted. I didn't look at the senior people um, at Credit Suisse and aspire to be them in 10 or 15 years time. And so at that point in my career, I was super ambitious, knew what I didn't want to do, but didn't really know what I wanted to do at that point. I'd always been fascinated by technology. My whole family's in the technology industry. I was in the technology team at, at Credit Suisse, so the TMT banking team, though to be fair, there wasn't a lot of tech stocks on the ASX back then. Um, so I ended up going to a startup and the way that I found this role was I was on Seek at 3 a.m. one night um, when I got home from the office and knew I wanted to be in a technology company and found a startup and joined it. And I joined in a, in a sales role. So it was a completely different role going from investment banking where I was sitting behind an Excel document in a PowerPoint for you know 18 hours a day to then being uh, front and center in a sales role, jumping in a go-get car, driving all around city, Sid, Sydney and selling a SaaS platform to charities to help them fundraise online and do peer-to-peer -peer fundraising online. The company was maybe 10 people. Um, so it was just such a shift, but I loved it. Um, absolutely loved being in a business. Um, and then after that, I ended up going into a sales role at LinkedIn. So I went to a larger tech company uh, and I was at LinkedIn for three years in an enterprise sales role. Again, really loved it. Really loved the energy of being around a, a sales driven team, um, dealing with clients. I, I loved everything about that. And what I also really liked about LinkedIn is we had a huge amount of data, huge amount of data on the platform that we were able to use to communicate value to our clients. And so that really, my sort of passions around um, great product and also using data and analysis to draw meaning and being very people focused as you are in a sales role. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. What led me to VCs, even at that point in my career, so three years into LinkedIn, I hadn't considered a role in VC if I'm perfectly honest. So um, this was five years ago. Um, 
uh, to be fair. And I, I had always thought if I was ever going to leave LinkedIn, it would be to either start my own business, become a founder or join a sort of series A startup and, and scale with it. Um, and then a recruiter contacted me about the role at Airtree. Um, and I realized that sitting across a portfolio of a whole lot of the best startups in the country, learning from these founders, working really closely with them and meeting founders constantly as part of my job, um, meeting founders who are building the future and being a part of their journey sounded absolutely fascinating. And so um, this was five years ago now, and I ended up um, joining the investment team at Airtree and I can, I can touch more on the experience since then, but that's sort of the, the journey into VC definitely wasn't something that I, I planned to do from when I was the age of five, but it is perfect, perfect for my skill set. Absolutely love what I do. Didn't quite plan this to be the case, but I always think of that, um, uh, Steve Jobs quote from the Stanford commencement speech where he talks about connect you can't connect the dots looking forward but you can connect them looking back and if I look back what I did was follow my passions I moved away from what I didn't like I moved towards what I did like and that eventually led to a job that I really enjoy now and brings in a lot of the skill sets that I built um, along the way to this role even if I didn't plan it that way so I'll hand over to Jax maybe to give a bit of her background nice and um, I think what's kind of cool about the story at least related to it at the start is that the story I'm about to tell is similar in some ways, but also very different in many ways. And I think that's kind of, if you take one thing out today is that there isn't like one profile that goes into VC. There isn't one path that leads there, one like perfect road you can go down. Um, most people kind of accidentally ended up in VC. And it's actually more about the kind of the values and the traits of the people that are similar versus like necessarily what they've done. Um, my story, so I grew up in the UK, as you can probably tell from my extremely thick accent. Um, I studied history at university. Um, it's much more normal in the UK to kind of study a academic subject that's nothing to do with what you want to do in the future and then kind of go into a completely different job afterwards. Um, and so I feel very fortunate that I was able to kind of study something I was just deeply interested in. Um, and spend three years kind of just learning. Um, and in many ways, I think that degree was perfect for the job I do today, because essentially my job was to consume a huge amount of information, analyze it and write up an opinion at the end of the week. So I'd read seven books in a week, roughly um, on a topic. I would like to analyze that and then write an argument at the end of the week. And essentially what we do today is meet a founder, try and learn everything about that industry and that business model and that product as quickly as we can, form an opinion and write up an investment paper at the end um, and take a decision. And then, and, and so in many ways, I think it was a, kind of a perfect degree, but probably not obvious um, starting out. And I didn't really think about my career a whole ton at university. Um, it's pretty just head down working and then kind of got to the end and realized I needed to get a job. And so um, talked to a few friends and one of them said, I think you'd be really good on the trading floor. And I was like, oh, I wonder what that is. I applied for 10 jobs, got one interview, and uh, and fortunately enough, started on the city grad scheme on their kind of, they did like a rotational program um, to start with. And so I was the only arts grad of kind of 40 people, didn't know what a bond was. It was pretty, um, it was pretty baptism of fire, but it was, it was a good fun. Um, rotated through kind of equity sales, FX sales, equity derivative sales, and essentially picked equity derivatives because I thought it was the hardest and it would just kind of be mo the most interesting to keep learning for a really long period of time. So I had absolutely no idea what it was about. Um, spent the next kind of 18 months learning economics kind of in, in, in real life, which was really, really interesting. I really enjoyed it. Um, but after about 18 months, started to kind of Get, get a little bored, start the plateau, started starting my own side projects on the side, like little businesses that I wanted to start and things like that. Um, and then, but I was too afraid to kind of jump out and take the risk. Like, you know, it was the amount I was being paid was, you know, more money than I'd ever seen. Um, I'd come out of uni where I just felt so poor the whole time. And like, I remember just thinking, like, I wish I had money for fabric softener. I remember that being like a really clear thought at university and I think I just you know you get the golden handcuffs and you think you know you're earning more than your parents did like decades into their career how on earth could you be so um 
arrogant or ungrateful to think that um that like there's more than this um and so after three and a half years at city i really wanted to leave but got given the opportunity to run a desk at merrill um and so it felt like okay this is a new challenge it may not be it may not be banking it may actually just be the, the company i'm at it's like the opportunity to run something like that's pretty exciting like, like i'll go do that and so i went and i um built the built the kind of business of U.S. hedge funds and institutions trading European equity derivatives at, at Merrill um, for a couple of years, and that was fun at the beginning. And again, I kind of stopped learning. And when 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 your transition from building to farming, essentially, um, it became a bit more boring for me. Um, and eventually, I did kind of. I remember it was this extremely emotional time for me, and we can we can kind of talk about this a bit later. But um, eventually. Uh, summoned up the courage with a little bit of Tony Robbins to uh, to jump out and, and do the startup thing. So um, I always wanted to start my own business. I didn't really have the confidence at the time to go and to go and do that. So I joined, went, decided to go join a high growth startup and learn how to do it from experience. Um, my perspective was I want to do a real world MBA, and so essentially I want to take two years and read every book I can on like the fundamentals of business and then actually go work in a high risk business. Um, I joined without a job description um, on 50k a year in Aussie dollars um, and just worked doing anything and everything. Eventually that role became chief of staff. Um, the founder was a product led founder and I kind of worked on everything. Go to market special product, special projects with him. Um, we raised a big round of funding from Peter Thiel's fund, Valar, moved the company over to San Francisco. And at the time, I wasn't, I didn't believe in the story enough to move my whole life over to San Francisco, particularly considering my partner didn't really want to move there. Um, and so at the time, we were both kind of getting bored of London, though. And so we moved over we decided to move to Australia um, because we both loved it and we've been a few times. And I thought VC would be a great way to enter a market and meet loads of people and figure out what company I wanted to start or join. Um, and started an ad venture capital fund. Um, corporate VC just wasn't for me. Like I knew kind of when I walked in the door on the first day, it was very jarring after having been in a startup to kind of be in a corporate again. Um, and so I didn't enjoy that so much, but I, um, I kind of liked the VC part. And then I got to know John and James and a few other people at Airtree. And um, when the role came up, I kind of put my hat in the ring and joined about three years ago now. So that's kind of my journey to Airtree story. Um, we should probably jump into a few of the questions now. Um, so, Alicia, I, I'll start by asking you a question from Eitan. When did when did you know you wanted to work in VC? I guess you've kind of talked about this a little bit, but yeah, I'll dive I can a bit more. Yeah, I can provide a bit more detail. And thanks for submitting the question, Eitan, before the before the session. So. Um, as I mentioned, a recruiter contacted me, um, and it's actually some of the parallels in Jackson and I's story that we we thought when we were sort of, sort of approached about it, that would be a good stepping stone to either start something or, or join a startup. And obviously, we're both taking a, diff a different approach now of progressing internally in a VC fund. Um, but I was I was pretty skeptical um, at the start. I, I didn't want to go back to the finance world. I wasn't. I, I didn't want to go back towards banking. I, I wanted to be an operator. I wanted to stay in businesses. So I probably went into it thinking. It might not be the right role for me, but open-minded. Um, I was in the talent solutions division at LinkedIn. So my role was selling a product, which is all about passive candidates and talent and how the best talent should be open to new opportunities all the time. So I thought I should walk the walk um, and, and have the conversation. And the first person I met with was John. Um, and then I met with Craig and I realized that both of them were operators and um, really passionate about helping the next generation of founders build very big companies and being a part of their journey along the way. And when I realized how many of the passions and values that I shared were aligned with theirs and what they were building at Airtree and what and, and where they really wanted to take um, 
take air how they wanted to grow air to the next level. It was super inspiring. And I realized that a lot of my values were completely aligned and it would be a role that would be a really great fit. So it wasn't really until I started having those conversations that I was like, oh my gosh, this sounds like a dream role. And a lot of the parallels actually, Jackson, your story, when you're speaking around getting bored, one thing I would call out is every role that I've had prior to my time at Airtree, I felt like I learned so much in six months, loved, like loved the challenge of it. And then I'd put that into practice in the second six months. And then after a year, I would just be looking for the next challenge. I'd be looking at like, where, where's the next, where's the next um, evolution of this role? And I'm five years into Airtree, into VC, and there's just no way you can possibly get bored in this job. I think the, the fact that you're constantly learning about new areas of technology, you're constantly meeting new founders, or the founders that you have worked with for many years are changing because their companies are growing, they're scaling as founders. So it's just so you're constantly learning that you just can't get bored. So I'm five years in and I'm nowhere near um, that feeling that I, I have felt with the other roles that I've had prior to this. So um, for me, I didn't know I wanted to be, fit, be, a, be a VC until I was sitting opposite a VC and hearing about what they do day in, day out and what they're passionate about. Um, yeah, so that, that would be the honest answer. What, what would you say about that one, Jax? When did you know um, you wanted to work in I VC? probably knew I wanted to work in VC about two years after I started in VC. <laughs> <laughs> Even later than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I um yeah, I think it's it's kind of the mindset of people who come into this job, I think they often don't think they would want to do it because they think they wanted to run a business. Um and I think for people who absolutely love startups and tech and business models and frameworks and all that kind of thing, um usually seem to have that kind of perspective. Um but they're also slightly um, slightly ADD, completely unable to focus on anything for one really long period of time. And that probably doesn't make them really well suited to being in a startup. Um, and so I think it's um, I think it's unsurprising that quite a few of us kind of maybe were skeptical on the way in and then almost got like dragged along by the journey. I actually, you know, I, I worked with an exec coach um, about a year into my it was probably a year in starting Airdrie, um, like trying to grapple with this whole idea of, do I want to go be a founder or do I want to be an investor? Um, I've enjoyed this investing thing much more than I expected, but I always thought I was going to be a founder. Um, so what do I do? And it was through working with that coach for kind of six months, I realized that she being an investor was my perfect job and I absolutely loved it. And I needed to kind of, unwrap my ego from this idea of being a founder because I wanted to prove myself that that's prove to myself that that was a thing I could do um and just realize that you know like the things I value most are curiosity and learning um analyzing things kind of and 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 really VC is and building relationships and VC is where I got to do that and so um yeah it took me a little while well, that's actually a really nice uh leading into our next next question, I guess, because we had one from Andy that was submitted, which is what made you want to move into VC? I think we've kind of covered that. But the second part of his question was, as you're both non-founders, do you think this puts you at an advantage or disadvantage? So do you want to tackle that one, Jax, given what you just discussed? Yeah, I think, um, I think people can be great at VC for a bunch of different reasons. And um, I wouldn't say that like, I'm great now <laughs> you know I think it's like I'm right at the beginning of a really long journey um and we'll figure out probably in seven to ten years whether I'm any good at this but um I I think people just are like excellent at it for completely different reasons some are excellent at it because they're the most connected people in the world and they can link a founder up with the person they want to speak to who's the global expert at whatever um really easily some people are great at it just because like people want to work with them they're really um great smart um kind people to work with they have conviction and they move fast um some people are great because they have operating experience and they've scaled a business to hundreds of employees and, and they have kind of hard-won lessons that are kind of make their advice very valuable i think people are good at it for different reasons um and i don't think you need a particular type of background you just need to kind of um lean into the things that you feel are you are good at and find out if they're valued by other people and, and I think so that means you can be a very different type of person what about you Liz do you have a, a kind of more coherent answer than I did 
No, no, I, I mean, I agree with you. Like, there's no, there's no set, um, just in that there's no set path to getting to VC. I don't think you can say you're, you'll be a amazing VC if you've been a founder and you'll be a poor VC if you haven't. It's just, it's just not that black and white. And a lot of our job is like that. There, there's, there's sort of more art than science to a lot of this. But if you look at the, the data, so if you look at the MIDAS list, there is no correlation between investors that have been operators or not and I don't know if anyone's listened to the most recent one of the more recent acquired podcasts um, where they go into Andreessen Horowitz and the story of founding them but actually they talk about how the narrative around being an operator VC just wasn't that prevalent until a 16 they pushed that narrative out there because it played to their advantage so what you'll see is the messaging that that when it plays to a certain VC strength they'll say you have to be being an operator to be a to be a VC and then you'll see the vice versa with with other funds that don't have that DNA what I would say is absolutely necessary is founder empathy um, but I don't think you've ha- you have to be a founder to have high founder empathy it helps to have been a founder and to understand that and have lived and breathed it it helps to have been in a business and just and to understand what that looks like but it's not saying if you haven't done that that you can't be a good investor but you need to show empathy to the journey being very tough it is like behind the scenes the founders go through the ups and downs and what we all see what everyone from the outside sees is this you know afr article announcing this massive capital raise but there is blood sweat and tears that have gone into that that point and i think understanding as a vc that um part of your job is to support the founders through that uh you've you've really got to have genuine founder empathy um but i wouldn't say I feel like I'm at a disadvantage because I'm not a founder. As Jack's mentioned, you can build your network, add a heap of value to the founders that you work with in so many different ways. Um, No investor is going to be able to tick every single box for a founder. What a founder would normally do is bring different investors on at different stages of their journey, knowing that that is the strength of this one, this is the strength of that one. And often um, they build out their board and their support around them so they can get lots of different things from lots of different people. So as long as you have one area that you're very confident that you can add a huge amount of value to that founder, that will help you not only find, you got to obviously find the best investment opportunities, but also convince that that team that you are the right partner for them at that point in their journey. So um, uh, I wouldn't say there's a bias one way or the other. You've just got to own what your unique differentiation is as an investor and lean into that. I um, will just jump in with um another question here that seems to be coming up a little bit in the chat um and the questions that are coming through um around do you need to have a finance background and i think i i want to jump in here because i um you know alicia said from her experience at school like she loved data and she loved analysis and numbers like i was the opposite like i like words i um i found that school numbers were always difficult and like the way i got good at it was i brute forced it like there's nothing natural about how I my relationship with numbers I have just brute forced it the whole way through um I technically worked in finance but I worked on the trading floor there were no models I didn't know how to do financial modeling before I joined Airtree I taught myself all of that and and was kind of coached by people in the team as well as I was upskilling so now I'm a big believer that you can teach yourself anything you want to learn um and particularly in the world of kind of business and um you know academic type pursuits so um i would say no you don't need a finance background but you need an interest like i was always fascinated by business the numbers weren't what interested me what the numbers meant were what interested me um and i think i always that's that's still how i see it like i think the numbers are just a way of like understanding competitive advantage um and kind of measuring success but the the really interesting stuff is the kind of qualitative more intangible stuff um and so no you don't need a finance background yes you do need to be interested yes you do need to demonstrate that interest um like I don't think we would want someone coming in who's like only ever done arts and comes in and says like I would love to be a VC but I can't tell you any examples of any companies I like and why I like them and why I think their business model is sustainable. So I think you kind of need to have that part. 
I think you can tell from Jax's story there that like she has this insatiable hunger to learn. So like she knew that that was a gap in her knowledge that would be useful in this role. So she just taught herself. So rather than focusing on what you studied or what you didn't study, it's like there is so much that you can learn online. There's so much you can teach yourself. There's so much you can suck up knowledge from other people and absorb it like a sponge. And I think Jax was just amazing at coming in and doing that. So rather than worrying about what's on your CV, it's just demonstrating that hunger and that willingness to learn and plug in those gaps. None of us are, com- you know, completely covered across every possible skill you need to do this job, but we're always willing to get better at it. And I think Jax was, Jackson, particularly around the modeling side of it, just demonstrated that in spades. Um, question here, Lucia, if you want to jump in and answer, how quickly could you pivot out of the VC world if you wanted to? Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting because we both spoke about our stories that we came into this role kind of seeing it as a stepping stone to another role. Um, So if you think about the most natural pivots out of VC, I guess one of them would be what we've both discussed, which is becoming a founder yourself. So you're in a role where you're building your brand in the sort of startup ecosystem. You're meeting with a whole lot of founders. You're seeing a whole lot of business models. You're getting to see behind the curtains as to what it takes to build a really successful company. So you're learning some really valuable skills if you do decide to go down that path. You're also learning how capital, how fundraising works, right? So that that journey, if you decide to be a VC-backed company, learning how it works on the other side of the table is super valuable. So that's a very transfer, a lot of transferable skills there that you can you know, do VC for an, a number of years if that's the path you decide to go down and then go and start your own thing. The other, the other path would be joining a portfolio company. So at Airtree, we have 70 portfolio companies across a whole range of stages, a whole range of industries. And being inside a VC fund, you get to work very closely with these founders. You get to work very closely with these businesses and see under the hood. So again, it's a very natural transition to then join one of those portfolio companies um, and make that make that your full-time focus. So if you see this as a, you know, getting into this, into this role and this industry as a stepping stone to something else, potentially it's becoming a founder, potentially it's joining a portfolio company. There's also more and more, I would say sort of eco ecosystem level roles that are emerging as the Australian ecosystem matures, you know, with some, um, some with a very large tech companies that, pro- that provide support to startups, some with government even. So there's a lot of different ways you could take it or, or you may end up like Jax and I, where we both thought it would be a stepping stone to something else and then ended up loving it and, and building a career uh, within venture. Anything to add on that one, Jax? Yeah, the only other thing I'd say is I think if I think back on like what I thought my, think my mistakes were when I was younger and how I thought about careers, I think I thought it, there was like an end goal, like that you climb a ladder to a place and like the point is to get to the top of the ladder and the point is to find your direction and get there. And I think increasingly, I wish I'd taken more risks. And I also wish I'd just tried things, committed, ran hard at them. If they weren't the right thing, moved to the next thing. Understanding that kind of over time, you're narrowing down to the thing that you actually enjoy. Um, And so I would say, like, it's very tempting to try and keep your options open the whole time and do the thing that's going to give you the most next options and do the thing that's going to keep you the most next options forever. But unless you actually just commit to something and try it, you're never going to find out either way. Um, and actually, like with the amount of people change jobs these days, nobody cares if you have if you only got a year or two somewhere. Um, so I would just kind of bite the bullet and try and try think more things. Mm. Yeah, I think that your your career is so long, and I think when you first start out your career, you there can be comfort in having this very set pathway, but you you are working for so many years, so try different things, explore different things and find what you love because you're going to be working for a a large part of your life. Um, And maybe this can lead in some of the the next questions we have around uh, one. We had one from Akshat that maybe I'll hand over to you, Jax, but um, he asked, what are some of the uncomfortable and hard things you went through in your career that you're glad you did? Yeah. So I think the hardest thing was leaving banking for me. I mean, I was there for nearly six years and I was like, without sounding like an idiot, I was good at it you know I, I was it was very there was a very clear path for me that's something I was good at that I made a lot of money doing um that you know my parents thought I would be an absolute fool to leave um and it was really 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 difficult psychologically for me to leave um and honestly I felt like 
ever since I left that job and everything worked out, I feel like that about everything now. I feel like taking a risk and it'll probably work out. is like the big swing between who I was before that moment and who I am afterwards. Like, I think before that moment, I would have always been much more nervous about taking those kinds of risks. And now I was like, yeah, sure. I'll move to the other side of the world without a job with a partner who also doesn't have a job and we'll figure it out. Like, yeah, our visa situation is probably a little murky, but I'm sure we'll figure it out when we get there. Um, and there have just been more and more of those things where I've kind of taken a risk on myself um, and it's worked out okay. Um, and so I think that's probably the hardest thing I did. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very pleased I did it. What about you? Uh, I could probably say the same story for me, Libby Maggie, but in the interest of diversity, um, I'll take a different challenge. I would say it's once I left, which, like I said, it, it wasn't an easy decision and I probably struggled with all the same things you did, Jax. But once I left, I was in a sales role. Uh, I had a quota against my head. I was very exposed. It was very different to being junior in a large team and not having a huge amount of responsibility weighing on my shoulders if we didn't close the business or close that deal inside a bank. I went to then being a sales rep where uh, it doesn't matter what UAI or ATAR you got. It doesn't matter how many books you read. None of that matters. What matters is whether you achieve your quota. And that's how sales rep is measured. And so I went from... Um, you know, being a small part of a big team to then being a, a, lone, a lone wolf in many ways and having my own book of business and being exposed. And I think at the age I was at and the level of experience I had, which I'd never done a sales role before, it was um, it was scary. It was a lot of pressure. And, I, and we can talk a little bit about how those skills help in this, in this role. And there's a lot of sales in VC, so we can, we can touch on that. Um, but I think having being so exposed at such a young age and having so much responsibility and doing a, doing a role that I'd never done before. I'd never used those skills before, but I had a natural interest and enjoyment of, and I was reasonably decent at it, um, was, was one of the hardest things. So adjusting, I think leaving banking was probably the hardest and the second hardest would have been um, then adjusting to what it looked like on the other side. Um, and from Eileen, have you ever worked somewhere that didn't align with your values? Um, yes, I mean, I could, I could talk about this for a, a long time. I mean, I, I sort of skimmed over it at the start in terms of um, banking and why I left, but I can go into a little bit more detail on this. I, um, I got so frustrated with so many things in banking and I felt like there was um, things beyond my control that no matter what I did, I wasn't going to change the bigger beast. Um, there was a lot of inefficiencies, processes that I think could be done very differently and um, I got frustrated that I didn't think I was going to have any impact on changing it. And for me, I, my, my solution to that was to, to exit the machine and, and find a different way. Like I said, I, we sort of touched on it before, but I really struggled with that because up until that point, I'd followed a very traditional path. I was very ambitious. I always wanted, I, I didn't want to be seen to be failing at anything. And I struggled with the idea that I would be stepping away from something and admitting that it wasn't for me, but I think it, a big part of it was I just didn't have that values alignment. And I think that is so important when you're committing your life and when you're an investment banker, you're committing a lot of your life to your job. Um, if you don't have that passion, that values alignment, it's just it's just not worth it. Like I said before, your career is so long. Um, and I've seen the extremes. I've, I've been part of an engine where I loved my colleagues. I thought it was a great company, but I just wasn't passionate about the broader picture or how the company was being run. And I think now being in a company where I have that alignment it just makes the, the world of difference so um Jackson I don't know if you have anything to add from your own personal experience yeah I mean mine was similar when I was in kind of on the trading floor like all anyone all the people around me really cared about was money and sports and getting pissed which was fine so like fun for, for the last couple of years because it's like an experience and whatever but um just like increasingly grew frustrated that the people around me like you know, weren't interested in learning new things or more about the world. And like, you know, you'd have kind of these senior people complaining that they only got 600 grand this year and they got 800 grand last year and it's never been like it was in the good old days. Like they're, they're, they're just lack of any understanding or like humility, just like I found it deeply frustrating. Um, and I, yeah, I just didn't, I didn't feel um, that connected to... The people around me and, and, and their values and I find what's been so interesting about moving to another country 
um, and kind of starting from scratch without any friends or anything else. I find that I've been able to kind of my work and my life is so interlinked now where like all of my friends I've really met through kind of tech startups, VC. Um, and I, I love the people I've met through, through this world. And we have so many shared interests and I learned so much from them. And I think um, that has been really impact, impactful for me. Um, and being kind of inspired by the people you work with, I think is, 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 is like a real privilege. Mm. And maybe this actually leads on quite nicely because we had a question from Aline as well, which is have you, oh, sorry, the second question is Henry's. Um, is there much opportunity for value aligned work in VC or is this structured in the sense of which projects you get involved in? Do you want to tackle that um, one? So, so, so it really um, depends what your values are. <laughs> it might, like, I think if I think about the things I value, like I love, I value learning. Um, I value building relation, long-term relationships with people who are doing hard things and being there to support them. Um, I really enjoy the intellectual challenge of the work that I do. And so I find like every aspect of, of, the, of the work aligns with my values. Um, in if, if, you're, if you're talking about values from a more kind of, um, like I don't want to do work that is not aligned with what I think is important in the world. Like, we don't invest in gambling, we don't invest in porn, we don't invest in weapons. Um, so I think we stay away from things that, you know, I think Craig often talks about, we want to invest in things um, that, our that we'd be proud to tell our grandkids about. Um, and I think we all believe that. And so I think if you can find the right team, um, you should be able to do work that aligns with your values and that should be a big part of how you choose what job you want to do. Mm -hmm. Anything to add, Vish? No, just that, I mean, I agree with all of that. And then I think you can do deep dives. As an investor, you can build areas of specialty in certain areas that you're most passionate about. So as long as you can build an investment case that stacks up, you can go very deep in climate tech or, or some area like that that you're very passionate about. And you can build a strong thesis around that and drive that towards an investment. So I guess you can you can make it what you want as long as there's a, a case for a strong investment and then there's also impact focused funds so there's ways that you can be even more that way inclined um it just depends on to jack's point what your what your specific values are i think there have been quite a few questions that have come up here around like i don't have a top tier consulting or back finance background like how do i get into bc um how would you answer that Alicia? I mean, we intentionally, I mean, we spoke about this at the start of the, the session, right, that there is no set path to VC. We actually try to screen this out in our um, hiring process to make sure we aren't biasing towards some top tier um, you know, institution or particular kind of degree that you've studied or a particular area place that you've worked by the first step in our investment process, for at least for an investment hiring, is asking questions around what Jack's mentioned before around what kind of investments would you make? What startups are you interested in? Demonstrating the kind of things that actually matter in this role, which is a genuine passion for technology and a general gen, genuine interest in, in products and people. And so, um, you know, we intentionally try to screen out for that because we just don't think it's important. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry so much about that. But to the point we discussed earlier, if there is a gap, if there is something in your background that um, you think will hurt your ability to stand out, it's just make sure you, you focus on what are those key elements that you need to be a successful venture investor, which is what we've spoken about with, you know, the curiosity, the, the ability to plug any gaps around, you know, financial knowledge, whatever that might be. And also just the, the interest in this space and the interest in technology, demonstrate that through your application process and show how, even though on paper, you might not have the right background or the right skills or the right degree that you've used your spare time to demonstrate those that that knowledge and that passion and build that out and fill those gaps um that, that's how i that's what my advice would be anything on that yeah. Jax? i i agree with you i think um there's a guy called turner novak in the u.s who is like really young and he's like i think maybe in his early 20s in michigan no contacts at all not the right uni not the right degree and he built a a personal portfolio of startups he would have invested in. And he 
built his Twitter following and talked loads about these portfolio and like spent loads of time reaching out to, to VCs and talking about companies he liked and why he liked them. Anyway, over a two year period of sustained putting stuff out in the world and, and outreach, individual outreach to people, um, that, those companies started doing really well. And um, over time, he's, he's been able to raise his own fund. And this is a guy without any blue chip uni, particular jobs, never worked in DC before. And he now runs his own fund that he's raised himself, purely off the back of just like hustling and showing his passion and interest. Um, and, and an early idea of being good at the job. Um, and I think about that a lot because it's very, very possible. Harry Stebbings, like very similar story. Um, and, you know, if, if I think about like when we're hiring associates and what are the categories we look for? I mean, it's like curiosity, love of technology and hustle is one of them. And I think, you know, you need to demonstrate that you have agency um, and that you're able to get in front of people and you're able to do the work. Um, because like that is the job, like it's a sales job. Ultimately, you know, you'll have to find really great founders. You have to build relationships with them. They have to pick you. Um, and I think if you can't do that stuff, if you don't demonstrate that you can do that stuff before you apply, then it's harder for us to pick someone. And and we very, very frequently will turn people down who have beautiful CVs full of um, wonderful institutions, but we don't think they'll be able to go and like, find someone who doesn't want to talk to them and make them and make them want and make them talk to us um and so yeah I think that's kind of a really big part of it too and I guess on that point is it's like don't hesitate to reach out to people that are doing the job and start to build your your network there that will be a key part of when you're actually doing the job is 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 building out your network. So, you know, every, most VCs and definitely everyone at Airtree is, is quite accessible on, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, via email, um, you know, reach out and start building your network. Talk about those, the podcasts that you listen to or your views on a certain startup and start to, you know, immerse yourself in this space before you, you want to enter it and start to build a bit of a, a personal brand around that. When I moved here, the way I got into VC was I just cold emailed a partner at every single fund and so and like had zoom meetings from the uk and had coffees when i got here and it was process of elimination of who was hiring at the time um who responded to my many many emails um i'm a huge fan of the cold email i think it um it works very very well and all of us have our email addresses available on the internet so um it's not that hard to do either I'm just going to jump back into some of these questions that were submitted before the session. Um, one was from Caroline. We might touch on this a little bit, but, but Jax, maybe you can answer this one. One from Caroline. What's an underrated soft skill in VC? It's just kind of what I was just talking about, which is I think many people think VC is a finance job and it's actually a sales job. Um, your job is to be able to you know, find great founders and build relationships with them. And, and I think a lot of that is natural to people. Um, you will know if you're that kind of person or not um, from a young age. And I think that's part of make, a lot of the people who want to start businesses also make good VCs because they have that thing of like seeing something they want and going and trying to solve it and trying to um, make it happen in the world. Um, and so I think just kind of having agency and being able to build relationships is, is probably the, the other soft skills I would um, value the most highly what about you yeah maybe just bring that to life into like a few examples where that comes in so obviously you touched on um you know finding great companies so having the agency to go out there and find them um build relationships with those founders and convince them that you're the best partner for them moving forward um, but also you also have to sell internally so to be a strong investor you not only need to convince the founder to take your money but you then need to convince your other partners in the in the venture fund that this is a great investment part of that is done through written word and through analysis which we've touched on but also it's just building a strong case and showing you have conviction around something um, and then the other piece is is limited partners so to have the right to deploy capital you need to raise that capital and so you know every few years everyone in a venture fund or first time fund managers it could take quite a while to get your first fund off the ground you are pitching to limited partners to get them to invest in your your fund and that's what gives you the right to then go out and write checks into founders um some of the sort of 
other use cases for, for the soft skills around sales that would be less, um, probably less common, but something that's also important is when you're a board member on a startups, uh, when you're a member on a, uh, a startups board, you're often helping them with really senior recruitment um, as well. So if they're hiring someone into their C-suite, that C-suite exec will often want to speak to someone on the board and particularly an investor and a lead investor around our investment thesis, why we got excited about this company and why it's a great, great opportunity to join. So um, those sort of soft skills around sales, um, sales skills that, that Jack's talked about is just so crucial for so many different parts of these roles. And I know there's that saying that every role eventually becomes a sales role, but in VC, right from the get-go as an associate, when you enter the investment team, it is primarily a sales role. Uh, from Lee, do you need a personal brand to get noticed? I can jump in on this one. So um, if we're talking about how to get into VC, I think it definitely helps. If you're, if you've already invested in building out your, your personal brand, whether that's through social media, through blogging, um, it, it helps because that's something that you're going to use as an origination tool to find great in, uh, founders, attract them to your fund, and then also um, build help them build conviction that you're the right partner for them because you've, you've built this personal brand. Would I say it's absolutely necessary? I think at the, the start of your career in venture, less so, but I think as you become more senior, it's going to become more and more important. And there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, I wouldn't say it's something you need to, to get noticed. The, the work that we were talking about, that Jackson and I have been talking about behind the scenes in terms of, um, you know, building conviction around startups, having your sort of paper portfolio, showing interest in this space, staying up to date with themes, starting to build connections with people in the industry um, is the most important skill set. I don't think we've ever, you know, cut anyone out of a recruitment process because they didn't have enough, you know, LinkedIn connections. Um, but it is something that it is very important to be mindful of when you start in this, in this career that you're going to make your job easier by building more of a personal brand over time. You have to be comfortable with that. This all just feeds into what we've been talking about, about um, attracting founders and, and making sure that you're a great partner for them. So Jax, do you want to build on that with your experience? Yeah, I think it's, um, kind of like Alicia said, it's, people do this job in very different ways. Um, and there, there are some VCs out there who nobody knows who they are and keep completely under the radar and, um, are extremely well respected by the founders that they work with. And as a result, they get you know, the right to invest in more amazing companies. And they never have a personal, they ne their personal brand is really a, not on the internet personal brand, it's a personal reputation by virtue of doing really good work over a long period of time. I personally think have like getting your voice out there is a really good way at the beginning to, earn the right to have conversations with the very best founders. Um, I've found writing on the internet really, really helpful as a way of, um, I think, letting people know what I'm interested in and providing a kind of shared context that means that when I have a first conversation with a founder, they often have found something in what I've written that they um, agree with or they feel like they know me a bit by virtue of the fact that they've read things I've written online. Um, and I think that has been a really helpful way of kind of building shared context and, and, and a bit of, um, I don't know, social capital ahead of like these, for these early relationships. Um, so I would recommend it and it's terrifying. Everything about it's terrifying. Hitting publish on a tweet for the first time is terrifying writing your first Medium post, it's terrifying. I have, I would say like at least seven Medium posts in a row that were my first seven Medium posts that have fewer than 30 views. Like I was just writing into the ether for years before anybody cared. Um, and I think that's the way you do it, right? It's the only way you get better. Um, but like, you just have to get over that fear. Um, and, and the more repetition, like the only way to get over it is just repetition. And so, the more you do it, um, the easier it becomes. And you feel safe in the knowledge of knowing that like, even if you say something stupid at the beginning, like nobody's listening. So it doesn't matter. Uh, they're gonna scroll past it if, if they don't care. And so, um, yeah, that would be my advice. I think it's a, it's a good way to accelerate things early on in your career. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of questions come through on the Q and A. I've just seen one here from 
David around what's a typical day like in the life of a VC partner? Um, I can have a quick crack here, but the, the answer is every day looks pretty different. If I try to bucket it into sort of three very broad buckets, we're constantly balancing our time between origination and finding the next best investment. You know, we, where we obsess over making sure that we, we're there to back the best 10 to 12 founders coming out of Australia every year. And so we're always out there meeting new founders, hearing from them the where the world's going, thinking about different um, new investment thematics and how the world's evolving and thinking about where the world's going to be in 10 years time and who are the great founders who are, who are making that come to life. The second bucket there is around diligence. So if we find a, a great company that we are really excited about and a great founder we want to work with, we write a, a, an investment paper, as Jack's mentioned earlier, and build a case to invest in that company. That involves a whole different range of things going from, right, from you know, high level market analysis to speaking with their customers, going through the financial data, using their product. It looks very different depending on what stage investment you're doing. Pre-seed is obviously going to involve a lot less diligence than a, than a Series C or Series D, very scaled startup. So we've got origination, diligence, and then the, the final bucket is portfolio support. So as a partner, when you lead an investment in a company, depending on your ownership, you often take a board seat. Um, if not a board seat, you're at least uh, having sort of regular catch-ups with that founder to support them through their journey. And so each investment you make, you add another another um, company to support on, on the portfolio side. So you're, you're, you're working with companies that you may have been working with for the last five years or maybe in the last five months or five weeks, and then you're always looking for new investments. So it's a constant balance between those three. I think in very specific terms, my day, my calendar, if you look at my calendar in the last two days, I probably had a, a an hour and a half where I haven't been in meetings. Um, it's a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings with founders, a lot of internal meetings on investment processes. Um, and then I try to block out a day a week for myself to get the deep work done in terms of thinking about new areas to invest in and um, writing the investment papers. But um, that sort of, it, it's, it's busy. There's a lot of different hats. You need to be okay with jumping from different contexts all the time and having a lot of balls up in the air. It's just the reality of, of, of what we do and what a typical day looks like. So no two days are the same. It's very busy. It's very high pay, fast paced, but I absolutely love it. Like I said, you can't possibly get bored. Um, anything you want to add, Jax, on the on the day to day? No, not really. I think it's it's, it's kind of leaning to me towards this question that nobody has asked, but I feel like someone should ask, which is like, who is VC not for? Um, and I think my kind of answer to that question is probably it is not for people who like to work on one thing for a really long, sustained period of time, um, because you will just not have the opportunity to do that. Like it, you are always context switching several times a day. Um, it's not for people who like to get deep in the weeds on projects and move them forwards over long periods of time. I think our job is to be, by virtue of the fact that we're looking at after so many different things all the time, our job is to be high level and probably be broad and shallow rather than narrow and deep. Um, and for some people that's not as fulfilling as being able to kind of really feel like they've owned moving something forward over, like, you know, releasing a product feature over a three, six month period or something like that. Um, so I think that's worth um, talking about. And then I think you need to be relatively okay with doing a lot of work alone. Um, I think people who thrive in teams and collaboration, um, we do we do collaborate, but like you, you're just working for yourself by yourself a lot of the time like you're having meetings with founders um by yourself you're doing research by yourself you're um you know the portfolio relationships you have are often um kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations and, and so you, you have a lot of relationships but like internally in terms of um collaboration there's just less of it and i think you know the the, the kind of typical way that we collaborate is we'll work in twos on deals um and so You'll be working one on one, say like a partner and associate working together on deals, and then um, we also kind of come together every week and we spend a day where we do meetings on the companies we're looking at and um, talking through um, investment uh, analyses and recommendations and, and the rest of it. So we kind of do all work together, but relative to other jobs, I said like you need to be comfortable. Um, it's a little bit more kind of self-directed and, and alone. 
There are also a couple of questions that were, and maybe Jax, if you want to eyeball the Q&A to make sure I've covered most of the topics there while I'm just pulling up some of the questions that were submitted before. There were a few more that we were given around resources. So some on podcasts and some on books for people wanting to get into VC and stay up to date with themes in the industry. So maybe I can touch on that while you're eyeballing the, the Q&A, Jax. Um, so I touched on one earlier, which was Acquired, which is a great podcast um, run by a couple of VCs that goes really deep into unpacking a company's journey, their, company, their, their journey from essentially being founded to acquisition, which is why it's called Acquired. And it's also the one that did that deep dive on Andreessen Horowitz that I mentioned. So definitely check that out. There's a few others, um, uh, like the ACCZ podcast is great on different themes. They'll go deep into a space and, and interview experts in that. Um, 20 Minute VC, which you mentioned Harry Stebbings earlier, Jax, um, invests like the best. There's so many we can talk about and I'll, and I'll let you, Jax, give over some of your favorites as well. On the book front, the one that comes to mind, um, it's a little bit dry, but it's called Venture Deals by Brad Feld. It, it goes through uh, a term sheet, which is the document that a VC gives a founder when you... Um, you intend to invest in them around all the terms that are involved in a term sheet. It also goes through um, the structure of a VC fund, how it works, how the economics of a VC fund work. So it's a really great primer on all things VC and what to expect. Um, the first time I ever read it, I listened to it on um, an audio book on sort of two, two times speed, I think. And it was, it's definitely not the kind of book to do that with because there's so much legal jargon. I ended up slowing it down and rewinding and end up just getting a hard copy and annotating it. And it's, um, it's a really good one just to get started in, in this space and, and, you know, like I said, economics of the VC right down to what a, what a liquidation preference is and how to, how to go through a term sheet. So we also have a lot of resources on our website um, under open source VC, which goes through our standard seed stage term sheet and explains a lot of the terms in very um, uh, founder friendly language. And for anyone who's new to the industry to understand what are the typical terms of VC invests under. So check out uh, open source VC. And also um, that would be probably my, my top book recommendation for someone coming into the industry fresh. Jax, do you want to add anything on, on resources and tips and tricks of people getting started? I just follow your curiosity, I think. And you've, you've named all the, all the ones that I think would be like the obvious first places to start, but really like the way I like to do it is you listen to one of those and then you hear what they recommend in the podcast episode and you go find that blog post that they're talking about or that book that they're talking about. And then in that book, you find about something else. Like you just follow the rabbit hole and like that's kind of the most fun. Like I think I've been learning a lot about kind of Web3 recently and have just largely been doing it through Twitter, Mirror and just like following threads. Um, and that's been a lot of fun. So I I'd recommend that. I think... Um, well, I don't think we have any time for any more questions because I know we have to wrap up in two minutes. Um, but if we haven't answered your question, please feel free to shoot us an email. Um, I think we covered most of the major topics that people were looking to, um, to get answers for. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope it was helpful. And you know, we're, we exist on the internet, so feel free to reach out to us. Thanks, everyone.